I think that the idea here, what I want to do right now is give you, um, or at least walk away with how we might be able to use these animal SPECT imaging technologies um, in experimental animal models of neuropathic pain. And what we're going to hear in a little bit after me is how we might be able to translate some of this technology to um, really feasible um, uses in the clinic. So we've heard beautifully last night from Dr. Watkins um, how the immune system can dramatically alter pain processing. And what we're learning now is as we find out about how the immune system can do this, we're also finding out new ways to develop drugs that are novel for controlling pathological pain. And so what I want to do here is go over some data, at least show you some pilot data, where we're now observing that perhaps not only glial cells are the only important population that could be participating in this process. There may be other immune cells, like leukocytes that could be extravasating into the spinal cord. So what I want to show you then is that there may be this ongoing sterile inflammatory process that's occurring in the spinal cord during ongoing peripheral neuropathy. And I'll also go over the idea that these glial cells in the spinal cord do play this surprisingly non-traditional role of creating and maintaining various forms of pathological pain. And so what I want to do is convey these ideas to you by addressing these major key points. And the first has to do with how we conceptualize pathological pain. We heard this last night, where when we think about pain, when we learn about it in our textbooks in the medical school, we think about it very simply. We don't think about glial cells. But what I want to do in the next part of the talk is tell you how glia became part of the story. We heard some of this last night. When glia are activated, they release pro-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-1, tumor necrosis factor, and interleukin-6. And then what I want to tell you or show you some pilot data where through the spect animal imaging, we're starting to observe that there are, there's leukocyte extravasation that's occurring in the spinal cord an additional cell population. Perhaps this is important in ongoing pathological pain processing. I also want to tell you, though, and you heard a little bit about that last night, that perhaps this presence of these leukocytes may not always be a bad thing, that we might be able to harness these leukocytes in a way that becomes therapeutic, perhaps through optimizing non-viral gene therapy. So with that, we all are aware that the pain, pain pathway, what we learn is that it classically consists of a chain of neurons. Pain in your body is picked up by sensory neurons that relay that information to the spinal cord and from spinal cord to brain. And we also know that this pain processing is very dynamic. We know that it can be suppressed. We also know that it can even be amplified. And so when pain becomes pathological, hot, cold, and hard pressure pains are now greatly amplified, and these non-painful warm, cool, and light touches are now perceived as very painful. And we also know that there's powerful pain modulation that occurs in the spinal cord dorsal horns where those sensory nerve terminals are communicating to the pain transmission neurons. So given we know so much about pain processing, then why is it that the currently available pain drugs fail so miserably in taking or at least treating neuropathological pain. But one possibility is because they're engineered to, to target neurons. So to give you a little bit of history of how glia became part of this story, there were some very intriguing observations that were being made in the 1990s. And Mark showed this picture, picture last night in his introduction. And Garrison and colleagues, what they did was they observed that glia were activated in the spinal cord. Astrocytes were activated in the spinal cord during animal models, in an animal model of peripheral neuropathic pain. And so what we can see here, this is a cross section of a spinal cord of a rat with unilateral sciatic nerve damage. Here is the healthy intact side, and here is the sciatic damage side. 
The sides look different, but we can't really see what's happening, so let's take a closer magnification view. Now it should be much clearer to you. These astrocytes here in the spinal cord in, an, in the healthy intact side appear much bigger and darker, indicating their activation. And what this group did was they used an astrocyte activation marker called GFAP, and this protein upregulates when these cells become activated. So we've heard about this. This isn't new. What was important here back then was that drugs that block neuropathic pain also block astrocyte activation in the spinal cord. So here is an example of that data where compared to non-neuropathic animals, animals with unilateral sciatic nerve damage showed a clear increase of uh, GFAP or astrocyte activation. However, MK801, which is a drug that's well characterized to block neuropathic pain, also greatly diminished astrocyte activation in the dorsal horn spinal cord. Now since these early seminal studies, a number of groups all over the world, independent groups, have now identified, and this is really just a sample of all of the data or all of the published reports, um, are, have shown now glial activation in the spinal cord and now in the dorsal root ganglia. Yes, there are glia in the dorsal root ganglia. And they have shown that they're activated in response to a variety of manipulations in animal models that leads to pathological pain. And so these manipulations can include infection and trauma, uh, or uh, inflammation of tissues, of peripheral nerves, of spinal nerves, and spinal cord. And glia are now known to release a variety of substances that lead to pain enhancement, pain enhancing substances such as all of these. We saw this last night as well. And importantly, these glial substances can further stimulate the release of substance P and excitatory amino acids, which we know are, are neurotransmitters and are neuropeptides that are known to signal pain. <coughs> so how is it then that these glia act to enhance pain processing to create pathological pain? They do so by exposing those pain a host of pain-relevant substances, but the power of these activated glia, as we know, extends beyond this list. It in fact includes those pro-inflammatory cytokines that we've been hearing about now over and over again. That is, tumor necrosis factor, interleukin-1, and interleukin-6 sometimes. What's important to also know is that neurons as well as glia express receptors for these pro-inflammatory cytokines. And each one of these cytokines can further stimulate the release of all the others. So one can now imagine that these cytokines can really be involved in mediating ongoing pain changes in chronic pain. Well, glia are now known. Glia, there are substances, so activated glia and pro-inflammatory cytokines are now known to be necessary in mediating a variety of animal models of neuropathic pain. And this extends to a very discrete peripheral neuropathic pain. And when you're uh, caused by infection, trauma, or, or inflammation of your peripheral nerves, when your peripheral nerves become unhealthy, neuropathic pain ensues. And this extends to a well-known animal model referred to as chronic constriction injury. And what this is, is it's an animal model where there's loose ligation of chromic gut sutures around one healthy sciatic nerve. So it's a model of both inflammation and direct nerve trauma. And in this model, it's well characterized, it's really a gold standard, that it leads to very clear development of pathological pain like hyperalgesia and allodynia. So I'd like to show you an example of the data where we've since now learned, or since then have learned, that these pro-inflammatory cytokines are always critical. And so here's an example where we're examining the role of interleukin-1 over the spinal cord. Now, to orient you, uh, since we will be looking at a number of slides like this throughout the rest of the talk, uh, to orient you to this data, if anybody has a pointer, maybe you could come up and give one to me because this part is really would be great. Uh, and I'm going to probably piss off the 
videographer here, but so in um, in this model, what this what these data are going to be are showing you are go, are hind paw responses um, from uh, light touch that's applied to the hind paw of um, the to the rat hind paw. And so this elicits a paw withdrawal response, and this is from a calibrated series of von Frey hairs. So under normal conditions, a hot, happy, healthy rat they respond to light touch at around 10 grams of touch pressure. But under pathological conditions, when pain is amplified, animals now respond to less than one gram of touch pressure. So we know that this dramatic increase in sensitivity to light touch is referred to as allodynia, and many of us here know that allodynia is a very serious problem for pain patients because simply putting on your clothes is now perceived as very painful. So, at baseline, we can, so the y-axis here represents stimulus intensity, and the x-axis represents time. And at baseline, we can see that animals respond normally at around uh, 10 grams of touch pressure. Now, when animals undergo, undergo a unilateral sciatic nerve damage, we see very clear development of allodynia as measured 3 and 10 days later. Now. Compared to various, thank you. I might, oh, I'm not getting a, not, still not getting one yet, okay. Um, so compared to various vehicle injected control animals that remain stable and allodynic throughout the time course, what we see when we block the actions of interleukin-1 over the spinal cord with interleukin-1 receptor antagonist, this allodynia is completely abolished with allodynia returning by 24 hours, which is in keeping with the short half-life of this drug, interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. So what's important to note here is if we were to repeat this experiment, so let these animals continue to be allodynic for two months rather than just 10 days, what we find is that the identical profile emerges when we block the actions of interleukin-1 over the spinal cord. So this tells us then that pro-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-1 are important for the maintenance of neuropathic pain and not just in its initiation. So what we wanted to know at this point then was whether or not interleukin-1 beta expression could be suppressed following an intrathecal injection of anti-inflammatory compounds. And so what we first needed to do was identify the increase of interleukin-1 in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord of a rat with unilateral sciatic nerve damage. And so here is an example of this data. It's uh, immunofluorescent quantification data where we see that compared to various vehicle injected con or various control animals that are not allodynic, those animals that undergo, undergo chronic constriction injury have a dramatic increase of interleukin-1 beta immunoreactivity or interleukin-1 beta expression specifically in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. So what we decided to do then is to inject an anti-inflammatory compound. Well, one of the ones that we're playing with, they're a little novel in terms of their characterization as anti-inflammatory. What we're starting to look at are cannabinoid compounds that activate CB2 or cannabinoid type 2 receptors. So they bind to and activate CB2 or cannabinoid type 2 receptors and they create an anti-inflammatory environment. This has been uh, characterized at least in cell culture studies. So what we wanted to know was whether or not if we gave these CB2 receptor agonists, which by the way are only expressed on macrophages and microglia, and other leukocytes, if we gave it intrathecally, what would happen to the levels of this interleukin, uh, the interleukin-1 beta expression? And what we found was that these levels were dramatically suppressed. So an anti-inflammatory compound not only completely reversed allodynia in this model, because these were behaviorally verified spinal cords, um, it also completely suppressed the increased expression of IL-1 beta expression. So if, there, if this is an anti-inflammatory compound, one would naturally ask whether or not it increases or has any effect on other on anti-inflammatory cytokines. 
one well-characterized anti-inflammatory cytokine is interleukin-10, which has been now well-characterized to control a number, uh, a control pathological pain in a number of animal models. And so what we decided to do was examine whether or not, what did this anti-inflammatory canout CB2 agonist do to interleukin-10 levels? And so here, again, compared to various non-neuropathic animals, those animals that had neuropathy had less interleukin-10. You can see a little smidgy there. So that was very interesting because there isn't very much in the literature. Sure, that would be great. Oh, it's not working? Okay, I guess that's what they're saying. It's on. So we have decreased levels of interleukin-10. I think this is very intriguing because there may be, I think there's a one study, I believe, out there that shows that in, in individuals that have chronic neuropathy, when we collect their cerebral spinal fluid, they have lower levels of interleukin-10 compared to healthy controls. So this is kind of an interesting effect, I think. But when we lock the actions of when we, when we in, inject an anti-inflammatory cytokine, okay, so now it's working. Thank you. Okay. What happens to interleukin-10 levels? They're increased or recovered back to basal levels. Talk about dragging out a story. So I think that what we're finding here is that when you suppress interleukin-10 expression, you have neuropathic pain. When you increase interleukin-10 expression, you control pathological pain. And so the lower panel is simply um, a fluorescent immunophotomicrograph, uh, uh, immunofluorescent photomicrograph, that is representative of the data that I just described here that was analyzed. And so interleukin-10 here is stained green. And what we see then in the middle panel is that animal with chronic neuropathy has lower levels of interleukin-10 in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord compared to the non-neuropathic animal or the neuropathic animal that had behavioral reversal following the anti-inflammatory compound. So this data told us then, the emerging story really tells us, and these data tell us, that in just about every animal model that has been examined to date, that glial pro-inflammatory cytokines are activated and are, and are produced and released, and that the pains associated with each of these animal models can be blocked by blocking the actions of these pro-inflammatory cytokines. So like I was saying before, or has, as I alluded to before, that these glial cells may not be the only immune-related cell population that could be participating in ongoing pathological pain. So we wanted to know whether or not there could be other uh, non-glial-related immune cells like leukocytes. But the question was, if we did see leukocyte enrichment in, for example, the... Uh, peri or the subarachnoid perispinal space, one question would really be, are those leukocytes, had they already been there, are they resident and proliferated there, or do they actively migrate in from the periphery? And so one way to answer this was to radio label leukocytes from donor rats, In here, in this case we used indium-111, and I think Jeff, uh, Dr. Norenberg set up very nicely um, all of uh, the, the, the experimental methods in which we label these leukocytes. And we injected them into rats that either had, non, that had uh, sham controls or animals that were neuropathic following chronic constriction injury. And then we could actually now visualize, where did these leukocytes go? We injected these leukocytes intravenously, so into circulation. So did they go to other tissue regions as would be expected? Or do they also actively extravasate into the lumbosacral spinal region? And so when we imaged these rats, we found, indeed, 
that they do, these leukocytes, these radio-labeled leukocytes, do migrate to the lumbosacral spinal cord region. And so what you're seeing here, this is a SPECT image of a rat with unilateral sciatic nerve damage. And while we observed, thank you, and while we observed, um, so while we observed a, a leukocyte extravasation into other tissue regions of the body as would be expected, uh, those filtering tissues like the liver, for example, we also observed leukocyte extravasation in the lumbosacral spinal cord. And so this was discrete in that we didn't observe it in the cervical region. And we observed this image at around 24 hours later. Now, clearly this is an experimental tool, but the question was, can leukocytes extravasate into the spinal, lumbosacral spinal canal region following a discrete manipulation like a peripheral neuropathy, a peripheral lesion? And so, and these, and in, uh, the uh, intensity of leukocytes can be calculated um, indirectly by uh, millicurie activity. And so, intensity here is co color coded where yellow white is considered most intense and the deep violet is considered least intense. The top panel here on the right is a cross section. Uh, of a control animal that was also injected with these radio-labeled leukocytes. Here is the spinal canal, and we could see there's some, seems to be some signal emerging from the spinal canal. And this is a cross-section from this rat that had unilateral sciatic nerve damage. And we can see that there is a very clear increase, a dramatic increase of this leukocyte extravasation. Uh, and we can see this according to the radiofluorescent intensity. And so the beauty here is that we can also quantify this. And what we found then is that there truly was a significant increase in, of these leukocytes that extravasate into the lumbosacral spinal cord in neuropathic animals compared to non-neuropathic animals. Keep in mind this is pilot data. What was important also was that this was region specific at day 10. So when we looked at the cervical spinal cord, we didn't see this dramatic increase. So that was very important for us to identify. Now, the question then becomes, well, what could be some of the signaling mechanisms that facilitate this kind of leukocyte trafficking? Well, there are chemokines, there are cytokines, but we really wanted to look at something that was directly responsible for the trafficking, the diapedesis of these leukocytes. So we heard from Dr. Norenberg, that uh, leukocytes express beta in integrins, or uh, like LFA1. And so what we decided to do was stain for beta integrins in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord to determine whether or not they were in fact increased um, in the dorsal horn, specifically in these animals that had increased leukocyte extravasation as observed by the SPECT imaging. And so here is the result of that uh, data analysis where, again, in that sham animal that had low levels of leukocyte extravasation, had uh, significantly lower levels of immunoreactivity uh, for beta integrins uh, than the neuro unilateral sciatic nerve damaged animal. Now, these beta integrins are interesting because they bind to and interact with intracellular adhesion molecules that are expressed on the surface of endothelial cells. And so what this does is when they bind, it mediates this transendothelial migration into the tissue parenchyma. So at this point, you know that all right, we've got, we have considered that pro-inflammatory cytokines are important for signaling and, and mediating pathological pain, and that anti-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-10, as, as I had suggested before, are important in controlling this pro-inflammatory cytokine signaling. And we know that in, anim, in other animal models that this interleukin-10 indeed is very effective in controlling pathological pain. So if we delivered the interleukin-10 gene to the spinal cord, the question then became, could we actually optimize this non-viral gene therapy in the presence of these extravasated leukocytes? Okay, so, so the first thing we wanted to do was optimize gene delivery by encapsulating it in synthetic polymers like polylactic, polylactic, um, polylactic acid.
And so this is an FDA-approved polymer that is uh, uh, approved for other uh, clinical purposes. And this is a uh, uh, scanning electron microscopy image of what these PLGA microparticles look like. And so what we do then is we take these little PLGA microparticles and we encapsulate our uh, free DNA or naked DNA, and then we deliver the gene encapsulated in PLGA intrathecally and determine whether or not it's effective in controlling ongoing pathological pain produced by chronic constriction injury. And so here is an example of that data where you've seen this, that after baseline assessment where animals are, are responding normally, we can see that compared to the various, the sham control treated animals, those animals that underwent chronic constriction injury of various <coughs> control treated injections show ongoing and clear allodynia. However, when we inject our PLGA micro encapsulated IL-10 gene therapy over the spinal cord, we see a very clear reversal of this allodynia that persists for as long as 74 days. So, when you look at the, when you look at, when you think about the amount of DNA that we're injecting here, which is really around eight to nine micrograms, that's remarkable because this is probably the least efficient way to deliver genes to the spinal cord. So the question then became, are these perispinal leukocytes being harnessed to take up this uh, intrathecal PLGA DNA gene therapy and then produce the interleukin 10? So we're in the, we're currently, studies are currently ongoing to further establish the exact mechanisms of how interleukin-10 is being taken up. Is it truly by these leukocytes, or could there also be uh, other cells like glial cells in the deeper parenchyma? So those studies are ongoing. But we did want to look at the biodistribution of PLGA following an intrathecal injection. I'm going to skip this one. And what we found indeed was these cells were, uh, these cell nuclei were labeled with a nuclear specific green dye. And red labeled microparticles, PLGA microparticles, were injected intrathecally, and we waited two weeks. And then we looked at their biodistribution. Um, in the, in, in the spinal cord. And what we found is that the spinal parenchyma is in this region, and the intrathecal space would be running along the top here. And what we see is that these little PLGA microparticles are evenly distributed and very closely associated with the cellular nuclei, and this is in the meninges. And what I want to point out here is that normally, this is in a chronic constriction injury animal, normally the meningeal layer isn't this thick. In fact, it should really only be several, several cell layers thick. So, so this was quite telling for us, and then we wanted to know actually what cells then could be interacting with our PLGA microparticles. So we stained for microglia, and as shown here on the left panel, the cellular nuclei in this case is stained with a nuclear-specific blue dye. Microparticles are still red, and we can see that uh, microglia uh, and OX42, which is an uh, antibody, clone that recognizes a specific marker expressed on microglia and macrophages. So this certainly doesn't exclude macrophages in the meninges here. This is the meningeal layer. We see very close association with microglia and macrophages with these microparticles. The uh, spinal parenchyma is in the upper portion of this uh, frame, and the intrathecal space in this case is now in the lower portion. On the right panel, though, when we use a marker, that uh, MHC class II marker, that really is a marker for a number of leukocytes and not just macrophages, we see that there's really a dramatic co-localization of our microparticles with these leukocytes. So we see many of these cells that are now co-labeled and appearing yellow. So, what it tells us then, perhaps, is that we've taken advantage of the presence of these leukocytes that have extravasated to this region because of ongoing neuropathy. And maybe that this non-viral gene therapy is working because we're delivering enough interleukin-10 gene such that the protein is being produced, it bathes the underlying glia, and calms the glia, calms the neurons so that pain is now controlled. <laughs> 
So in conclusion then what I have shown you is that glia, activated glia and pro-inflammatory cytokines are critically important for various forms of animal models of pathological pain. So under conditions that lead to pathological pain, it activates the glia to release pro-inflammatory cytokines that in turn amplify pain signaling. And I've shown you that there appears to be at least some evidence of perispinal leukocyte migration surrounding the spinal cord in regions that are important for pain processing. And so it's region specific. And lastly, that we can perhaps take advantage or harness the, these leukocytes um, uh, with some therapies like non-viral gene therapy such that we can now increase our interleukin-10 production. Um, and so I think that's all I'm going to say. And of course, this work has come from a wonderful team of collaborators. I would like to particularly note my um, graduate students, uh, uh, Ellen Dangler and um, Jenny Wilkerson, and a re wonderful, wonderfully talented research assistant, Audra Kerwin. I ha also have some wonderful colleagues at the uh, University of New Mexico, Dr. James Wallace, as well as uh, Linda Saland. And, uh, of course, Dr. Jeffrey Norenberg at the College of Pharmacy and my collaborators at the University of Colorado, Dr. Linda Watkins and Melissa Mahoney. So thank you very much for your attention, and I can take questions now. <laughs> Dr. Koshkin. Dr. Milligan, thank you for a very interesting talk. <clears throat> Now, I didn't study anatomy of the mice and rat, but it sounds like they actually have spinal cord and lumbar spine, which humans don't. So when we use dorsal column stimulator to treat pain, we put it in a low thoracic region. Am I to understand that that would be equivalent region where the first processing happens after the input to the CNS? Yeah, the input from the CNS occurs at the level of L4 through L6. Mm -hmm. For the rat, right? For the rat, yes. Okay. Now, all the previous uh, talks about imaging, they were all focusing on a brain, and last time we had this discussion, fMRI cannot image human brain because of the technical limitations to go through the bone. Now, you, your data suggests that there is processing and changes from neuropathic pain at the level of spinal cord. That means that the other studies that show imaging of the brain uh, are actually secondary, in a way, and that you may completely not see anything in the brain if something addressed at the level of spinal cord. Is it, what that, what well, that means? I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say secondary because if we're talking about, so, so, so if we're talking about a fenestrated blood-brain barrier, it's possible that we could be talking about circulation to brain and bypass spinal mechanisms. However, it's classically understood that we have to start at the level of the dorsal horn and go from dorsal horn to brain. But if you think about pain processing now, differently than what we learn in our textbooks, it may not necessarily be the only route in which there is excitatory signaling or pathological events that can occur that can then affect brain regions responsible for pain processing. So there are some very interesting studies that are coming out now showing that there is mast cell extravasation into the thalamus in regions responsible for pain processing. That certainly wouldn't require a spinal mechanism. So, so, so and, and of course, if in our animal model, so this would be a very, very interesting experimental question. Our animal model is looking at a, highly, a very localized lesion of a single peripheral nerve. So is it possible then, if you simply block increasing messages at the level of the dorsal horn spinal cord, could you also block that extravasation that was observed in the thalamus? And that's a study that we can do with this whole animal imaging because we have the resolution to look at thalamic nuclei and see whether or not these radial label ligands are indeed present there. So um, we have to experimentally determine that question, that answer. Yes. On one of his slides, he showed uh, CB2 antagonist is anti-inflammatory. It's actually CB2 agonism. Uh, or agonist. Mm -hmm. 
uh, that's a cannabinoid receptor CD2? Yes, it is. Do you mm -hmm. know what uh, um, compound uh, Yes. You were so the to? compound, I didn't want to complicate the, you know, the story, but the compound is novel. It's uh, recently been described by a group um, from Dr. Andrea Holman. She's the senior PI. And the compound is made from um, Alex Macrianis at Northeastern University in Boston. And the compound's name is AM1710. It's a highly selective CB2 agonist. It binds only CB2 receptors wherever they are. Mm -hmm. That would have been the next question. Uh, and another question, when you look histologically in the spinal cord, there is a, particularly the dorsal root, a transition zone that has constitutive, at least in the rat, MHC class to molecule expression. Do you see the extravasation to happen preferentially there? Well, we don't have that kind of resolution. So what, or at least not with the SPECT imaging, but certainly with the immunohistochemistry we do. Um, and I think that what we need to do is go back to these studies and look at MHC class II specific expression in the dorsal root entry zone as well, and I think more importantly, uh, look at the other lamina more carefully, the deeper lamina more carefully. Thank you for that. Yes? Uh, so, uh, those, uh, those activated glias uh, and pro-inflammatory cytokines are responsible for chronic pain. Is it understood what keeps those glias activated? So what we think could be happening is that if it's, so if the glia are activated from a signal um, f under a condition where the ideology of pain is by a peripheral neuropathy, then the idea would be that we're thinking about a neuron to glial signal mechanism. So as long as the peripheral neuropathy is present, for example, uh, the central nerve terminals of, uh, of, of of, af of afferent fibers release chemokines. Um, and those chemokines actually bind to receptors on glial cells. And then that in turn can create this cascade of glial activation, pro-inflammatory cytokine release, other chemokine release, and other factors that can communicate back to the presynaptic terminal, that incoming fiber, as well as the postsynaptic terminal. So you can imagine a very robust feed-forward event. I think sometimes, because of the plasticity, you can actually have the peripheral lesion completely go away, and you have this maintenance of ongoing glial excitation, neuronal excitation that c occurs. And um, that question is up for, I think we're, that we're in the process of trying to understand those mechanisms. So Aaron, in, in your studies, uh, in the imaging studies, you showed uh, uh, leukocyte extravasation in the lumbosacral spinal s segments. Uh, have you done any time core studies as to when this occurs after the CCI? So, yes. That's a very good question. Thank you. So the question was, have we done time core studies? So in our CCI animal model, what if we let our animals go for 75 days? Have allodynia for 75 days. What do we see at that point? And we see not the same levels of leukocyte extravasation, but I would say five-fold higher. So um, there is a dynamic, ongoing process that's occurring and changes from the beginning to at least where we stopped. Our most recent studies are at around 75 to 80 days. What we really need to do is move away from taking leukocytes from animals and injecting them into other animals and identifying <coughs> these, radio, these small molecule radioligands that can mimic the same kind of or uh, yeah, mimic the same kind of pattern. So one possibility could be in tagging LFA1-like compounds and identifying whether or not now it opens up a whole different avenue for us to see not only what's happening in spinal cord but in brain and when and then looking at therapeutics and determining whether or not this in fact when pain goes away do we actually see a decrease in leukocyte 
you know, so can we separate out the two events? What's the earliest time interval that you see? Ten days. Yes. I am a bit confused. Um, I'm not a neurobiologist, but I've always learned that the CNS is immune privileged. And, well, there, there's, ma Sorry. there's mainly two mechanisms. That is, the blood-brain barrier is closed, and the, any immune cell in the brain is not supposed to react. Right? Um, well, you showed yourself that there's IL-10, which is really, uh, well, it's possibly an important factor in this, in this process. Well, I've always learned that regulatory T cells are really important in dampening the immune responses in any organ, including in the brain. And during these two days here, I have not even heard the word regulatory T cells. So what's, what's the deal there? Is it, nobody investigated it, or it's too difficult, or they, they don't play a role, or? Regulatory T cells play a role. The literature has shown, well, there's parallel data. So there's supporting data. The literature has shown. You take a peripheral neuropathic animal, look at the spinal cord, look at the DRGs. Dr. Saab is going to tell us, I think, I know some of his prior work, um, has shown extravasation into these critical pain processing regions. So the central nervous system is not immune privileged. That's the take home message. So what we're learning is that under these discrete pathological conditions where it may not necessarily be ov very obvious up front, how do we know that we, what we're setting the stage in these animals, for example, isn't, isn't happening immediately in the spinal cord, but the phenotypic expression is observable 72 hours later. So when people take a look at the spinal cord 72 hours, 10 days later, two weeks later, they see these dramatic changes in T cells. That's why I say leukocytes, because it includes T cells. Uh, in some cases, B cells, depending on how leaky the, bread, the blood spinal barrier is. And of course, macrophages that migrate into the spinal cord. And of course, the microglia. The question is, what's setting all of this off? What's creating this environment that allows for this to happen? I think that's really where we need to go. What's known about whether or not IL-1 beta um, or TNF-alpha actually actively inhibit um, IL-10 expression? Uh, or is there, when IL-10 goes down, is it more, there's a lack of stimulus for maintained IL-10 expression? So I love that question. So experimentally, the really, is it that interleukin, what induces this decrease from baseline of interleukin-10 expression? Is it simply, or not simply, but is it due to an increase in pro-inflammatory cytokine expression? What's causing this change? Because if we have decreased interleukin-10, it seems to be closely related to the development of pathological, or at least the expression of pathological pain. So we need to ask this question. How do we, how is the interleukin-10 levels, how are they upregulated or, or downregulated? And another final point I want to make here is that I didn't show you an image where there was an overexpression of interleukin-10 it was a recovery to baseline, so that perhaps overexpression of interleukin-10 may not be the best way to go. We may just really want to deliver interleukin-10 levels such that it mimics what one would normally see at basal levels. So those questions, we need to ask those mechanistic-like questions.